some troubles but God is good he is faithful as we sing this next song and sing about him being a victor just listen to the words the words say he fights for us he uses angels to protect us he helps and defends us he's our friend and yet he's our savior he's overcome and he's powerful to help us overcome he intercedes for us he hasn't been defeated. Listen to the words of this song. He has overcome so we can overcome. You were always fighting for us. Heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend by your grace I live and breathe to worship you at a mention of your greatness in your name I will bow down in your presence fear is silent for you wear the victor's crown let your glory fill this temple let your power overflow by your grace worship you hallelujah you have overcome you have overcome hallelujah Jesus you have overcome the Come the found, you can never be defeated, for you wear the victor's crown. You are Jesus the Messiah, you're the hope of all the world. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Hallelujah.
Henry does that.
forgiveness that sin lets for me. That heals the sick, 
morning I want to read from Psalms chapter 27, verses 1 through 7. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil comes to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek the most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when trouble comes. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary I will offer sacrifice with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much, O God, for the freedom to come, Lord, the liberty to come and worship you, Father God. In one mind and in one accord, Lord. God, I thank you, Lord, for the freedom, God, that we can publicly proclaim your name, that we can shout and we can proclaim the name of Jesus at every corner, Father God. Lord, I thank you for those who serve this country, Father God, and fought for that freedom. God, I thank you, Lord, for leaders who still stand for you, oh God. God, I pray right now, Father God, for those leaders that's above us, God, that you would change their hearts, Lord, that you would get them on the right path with you. God, that they would lead according to the word, not according to selfish desires. God, I pray that you would touch this service, Father God, as we humbly come, Father God, and we worship you, Lord. I pray that it would be a sweet smell and savors to your nostrils. God, I pray that you would touch us, Father God, and that you would undergird our worship, Lord, that you would accept it, Father God as a humble sacrifice. God, I pray that you would touch and minister to each and every person, Father God. God, I pray that you would take us, Father God, further than we've ever been before. God, I pray that you would just strengthen us. God, I pray that you would touch each and every need, Father God, those who's lost, Father God. For the Crocker family, Father God, I pray that you would just bless them, Father God. That you would give them peace, Lord. God, for those who are suffering from the floods, Father God, I pray right now, God, that you would just touch them, Father God. Give them peace in this time of trouble. Because, God, you are a way maker. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to welcome all of our visitors. If you're a first-time visitor, if you just slip your hand up. We're so glad you chose to join us today, to our first time visitors, to our, there was one back there, Brother Charles, to our regular attenders, we're so glad you chose to worship with us. Let's stand and take a moment to fellowship with one another, make sure you let our visitors know they're welcome, be blessed in Jesus' name.
night. Always enjoy an opportunity for some good fellowship and meeting maybe some of those that haven't been here in a while or maybe some who haven't been here before. We're glad that you are here today. I want us to take just another moment to, uh, to, to pray. We have several uh, that have lost loved ones that we, we want to remember. Brother Brandon mentioned in his prayer the Crocker family. We want to pray for Brother Dennis and his family, the loss of his sister Brenda. She passed away last Sunday, um, and uh, so we want to pray for Brother Crocker and his family. Also, one of your former associates, Brother Gerald Funderburk and his wife, lost a son, Robbie, and uh, was fighting cancer and uh, passed away this week. So we want to pray for the Funderburk family. And also, uh, one in our community was involved in the school system, Brother Scott Atkins, uh, passed away. He was... Uh, football coach, softball coach, and some of us years ago were involved in upward basketball along with Bellevue Baptist at the time, and we got close to Scott and his family, so we want to pray for them as well. Is it okay if we just take a moment and pray for these that have lost loved ones? We still have some that maybe it's been several weeks, but we understand the, the grief is still very painful, especially at the holiday season, and so we just, we just want to pray a prayer over all of those that have lost loved ones and, and you're still dealing with that grieving process. We understand how real that is. And we just want to ask the Lord to bring his help, his peace, and his love to you in your life today. Can we just do that? Father God, I come today on behalf of families who have lost loved ones recently. And God, we understand how real the grief process is, how, how painful it is. And so we pray today on behalf of uh, friends, on behalf of church family who have lost loved ones and are going through this process, we pray for them today. We pray for Brother Dennis Crocker and his family and the loss of his sister Brenda. We ask God that you would just touch and minister to them. Let your, your spirit be real to them. Let the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit be awesome to them in their lives throughout this time. We also pray for the Thunderbirds today that you'll touch them in the loss of their son, Robbie. God, that you'd watch over them, that you'd put a hedge of protection around about them, speak peace to them today. Also, for Scott Atkins' family, Lord, we, we just pray today, God, that somehow through all that is said and done, that somehow the Lord gets glory and praise. I know that the process has been such that, Lord, that has been so because of things that he had seen before, things he had experienced before when he had a great sickness a year ago. And God, we thank you that you prepare us and you, you speak to us in ways that help us to understand that, Lord, you are, you are coming for us and it pays us to always be ready when you come. Lord, for others that may be in the room today who, who in the last weeks or months have lost someone in their family, we pray for them as well, that you would encourage them and lift them up and that, God, you would just uh, minister to them as only you can by your mighty hand. We'll be careful to honor and bless you, Lord, for all you do for all of these families today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for allowing us to, to do that today. I join with uh, Pastor Brandon today saying welcome. We're glad you're here, and we hope that while you're here, you will experience the awesome presence of God and that somehow you'll have that encounter with him that will absolutely revolutionize and change your life. He will do that if you will let him do that. So we're glad you're here today. Our ushers are going to come and wait on us today. Uh, just to remind you today, really today and Wednesday are the last opportunities if you have gifts that you would like to give uh, and have them to be counted uh, in regards to the, the financial statement you get for your taxes. Those need to be uh, done today or at, at the latest by Wednesday or at least by the 31st. I know Wednesday's the last church opportunity, but uh, I hope that we give first and foremost because we love God and because we love His work and because we're thankful to be part of the kingdom of God. His kingdom is vast. His kingdom is huge. It's all over the place. It's around the world. But you and I get to participate locally here at this uh, place we assemble together. And God has specific plans and purposes and things that He has desired and planned for us. And I'm grateful to be part of that, and I know you are too. And the way we continue to see that happen is when we support faithfully and consistently and our giving to the Lord. He's blessed us, and I want to turn around and bless Him back, don't you? 
I want to give and bless him back. So let's pray together as we give our gifts today. Father God, thank you that you have blessed us in awesome ways. We can never thank you enough. We can never praise you enough for all you've done. Lord, we don't even have enough words to express the things that you have done for us. Father God, one of the greatest things we can do is be faithful to your word and to do what you've asked us to do. And so today, come, we come today, Lord, cheerfully. We come today gladly to give our gifts to you because of our love to you, because of the great support you've given to us, but because we also want to honor and be faithful to your word. And today, Lord, we give our gifts. We ask that you receive them today. Multiply them. Help them to be everything they need to be. For the advancement of the kingdom of God, we pray. Amen.
What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. I have three passages of Scripture I want to read this morning. Genesis chapter 19, Philippians chapter 3, Luke chapter 9. They'll be on the screen. Particularly, you want, probably want to put your finger in Luke chapter 9 because that's where we will end up talking. But each of these verses or passages contain a word or phrase that gives the direction for what I think the Lord has laid on my heart for today. Genesis chapter 19 verse 26 says, and this is referring to Lot's wife. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And if you're there at Luke chapter 9, I want to begin at verse 57. This is Jesus speaking. It came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And, I, and another also said, Lord, I will, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell that are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now the question I want to ask this morning is should you and I look back? Should we look back? Now let me set the stage for this question. Over the Christmas holidays, and I'm talking about the 23rd, 24th, 25th, I, I had a personal struggle going on inside of me. Part of me wanted to look back, wanted to dwell on the past year. What's been accomplished, what has failed, what is right, what is wrong. The other part wanted to look ahead, wanted to think about the programs and the training and the things we've talked about implementing and doing, planning for the future, the building of a new church facility. I was torn between the past and the future. Late on Christmas Day night, I realized that this tug of war between the past and the future had really made me miss the present. I wasn't a Grinch. I wasn't a Scrooge. I didn't walk around and say, Balamba. But something in me was not at peace. 
Christmas Eve night, as I talked to the Lord, or Christmas Day night, I talked to the Lord, the Lord spoke to me a question, what are you going to use the past for? I didn't understand that. It's not the response I was looking for. And the Lord said it to me again, what are you going to use the past for? And Then I began to try to, to understand what it was the Lord was saying to me. The Lord was saying, if you use your past to dream and wish you were there again, you're never going to see the value of your present or what God can do in the future. You're always going to live backward somewhere. If I use my past to feel bad, if I look back in my past just so I can keep replaying the thing that I had done wrong or, or, or how I messed up in my life, my past has power over me to hold me hostage. I never get forgiveness of whatever happened in my past and I'm bound to something that is behind me. I can never be of value to my present. I can never accomplish what God wants for my future if I'm held hostage by my past. If all I do in looking back to my past is thinking about the good old days, you, you remember the good old days when you were in high school? You, you, I, I thought I was big in high school, and now I wish I weighed what I weighed in high school. 186 pounds. I'd give money for 186 pounds. My friends that I used to eat lunch with, Pastor Sheely's daughter Kim and I and Ann Rowland and and the Bessemer, can't think of her name, used to eat lunch together every day. The good old days, when we first got married, we went to school full-time, worked part-time. And if it had not been for buy one, get one free, you've heard me talk about this, we would have starved to death. The good old days, when our children were little, now they're big. We were talking about it, reminiscing, making our Christmas photo this year. How Lisa and I started out as two, now we're nine. The good old days. You know, sometimes we can so long for the good old days that we forget God can make today and tomorrow awesome days. Yes, the past were good days, but God can make today a great day and tomorrow an awesome day. It's okay to go and look backward as long as you know what you're going to use the backward for. For instance, I think it's okay to look backward if you're going to use it to define distance. Distance to me is how far I've come from where I was to where I am. Where Jesus found me to where he's brought me from. I like that song that says, if you could see where Jesus brought me from to where I am today, then you would know the reason why I love him so. If you look backward because you want to really justify or see the distance between where Christ found you and where you are, it's okay to look back. The problem is, is if you look back and you're no farther distance from where you were when he found you, and now you're 20 years later and you're the same place you were, there's a problem. I think it's okay to look back, not only to define the distance, but to be able to say, thank God I departed. Thank God I left. And sometimes people are stuck. You talk to them about Jesus, and they don't want to leave the life they're in. I thank God that Jesus found me and got me out of the life I was in. I look back to say, thank God I don't live there anymore. Anybody happy you don't live there anymore? Been on airplanes where people get on who are afraid to fly. They'll get on, hurry to their seats, sit down, buckle themselves in, pull the little slide thing over the window, and close their eyes. The plane moves, you know, they're loading luggage and, and closing the door, and it's jostling and moving, and then all of a sudden you feel yourself move, and they're pushing you away from the terminal backward, and then you taxi down the runway, and what you'll notice is every once in a while, they'll open their eyes and they'll peek out the window to see how far they've come from where they were to where they are, and they know they're now closer to their departure 
than they've ever been before. I think it's okay. To look to our past, if we're trying to judge the distance from where we are to where we were and to know, thank God, we've departed where we got off. I think it's okay to look back too. If you want to use your past to weigh or to value your future. Can I tell you the weight or the value of your present in Christ will always be more valuable than anything you had in your life of sin. See, sometimes the thing that we hold on to that we think is of such value and of such purpose, it will never weigh more, it will never be more valuable than the first day you've committed your life to Christ Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. You see, if you go back and you're reading this Word, you'll find in this Word... Where the word talks about remembering. It talks in terms of how that God remembered. You'll remember at times he remembered barren women. And it says he remembered Rachel. And how that he gave her ch children, gave her a child. He remembered his covenants. He remembered Abraham. Aren't you glad God doesn't forget us? The word also talks about the time that the children of Israel and the people of God remembered God's covenants, remembered God's promises, remembered God's plans. I'm here to tell you, if there's one thing you ought to remember, you should never forget God's plan, purpose, and design for your life. I met my friend back here, Ted Fletcher. Can't remember his name. I told him I'm going to say it ten more times before I can remember. I have trouble sometimes remembering people's names. But I do not forget that God loves me. I do not forget His plan for my life. I do not forget that He made a promise that if He goes away, He will come again and receive us unto Himself. That where He is, we can be also. We need to remember the plans, the promises of God. What happened in Genesis 19 is way different than what I've talked about today. Lot's wife looked back from behind him. She didn't look back because she wanted to judge the distance. She didn't look back to see how far they had come from Sodom to where they were. She did not look back to say, thank God I departed. She did not look back to see the value that was coming to her life because they were obedient to God. Lot's wife looked back because she loved Sodom she was still connected Lot's wife left Sodom but Sodom never left Lot's wife and the Lord clearly told him if you look back you'll turn to a pill of salt Lot's wife looked back guess what happened she became a pill of salt you see her attachment to her past was something she could not get rid of this is what holds people down this is what holds people back even when they try to commit their life to Jesus they have not cut loose their attachment to their past listen if you're looking back because you're attached to your past if you're looking back because you still love what you used to do in your past you're going to have a problem you've got to cut loose from the past you look to judge the distance you look to say thank God Christ found me and took me out of there thank God my value in him is more than the value I had back there but don't ever look back there with an affinity and a love for your past cut the connection Paul told the Philippians we should forget the things which are behind and press towards the prize, the high calling of God. Paul said, we haven't arrived yet. I haven't arrived yet. I haven't become everything I need to be. And, 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 and there's work to do. There's things to do. There are people to reach. We've not yet done all we can do for the kingdom. There's more lives to impact. There are more souls to be saved. There's more work to be done. So quit spending your time looking back when what we ought to be doing is finding where Jesus is, keeping our eyes peeled to where Jesus is, and marching forward for His glory. Glance to see how far we've come? Absolutely. 
glance to see where we failed and come up with a plan to do it better? Absolutely. Glance to see how much value is in your life because Jesus lives there? Absolutely. But glance because you still are attached to that past? A, 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 a glance because you love? No way. Jesus, in Luke 9, gives us an example. Of the, uh, he tries to describe it to us using something that the people would understand. Now, some of you may not understand it, but if you've been through history, you've seen it. There's a lot of things <laughs> that if we were to give a test today to the younger generation, they would have problems. Do you know there's not a whole lot of people that cook anymore? I'm not talking about, you know, when you've reached that age where it's, cheaper maybe to eat out than it is to cook I'm talking about got little kids at home well, I'm not this is not cooking class don't get mad at me but they put a stove in homes we don't use them I've seen people that actually open the oven and put their dirty dishes in there because the sink's full it's a hiding place You know what Jesus talked about? Jesus said, anybody who puts their hand to the plow, a what? A plow. One of my most fond memories is, uh, is borrowing Brother Ben Arnold's garden tiller. Wanted to, to till on both sides of my driveway and put monkey grass down both sides. I didn't have a tiller. Brother Ben had always told me, anything I got you, you can use it. So one day, I borrowed Brother Ben's tiller. And, and I don't know much about them, and so I'm, I'm tilling away. And, and I shear off one of the pins in the tine or one, that held on one of the tines. And I thought I done broke Brother Ben's tiller, and I was trying to cry out to God, Oh, Lord, help me. Perform a miracle. I, I, I need help. <laughs> And when I looked at the other side and realized what I need, I just needed the cotter pin. So I, you know, I fix, I fix, I fix his, I feel good. I fixed his tiller. Anyway, that's, that's a plow. You know, there are other kind of plows. Jesus is talking about a, a plow. I've got a picture I want you to look at. This was found inside of a cave, inside of a, 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 a temple, inside of a, a place where a dignitary was buried. This is thousands and thousands of years ago. This is a, like a hieroglyphic. It's painted on the wall. And what you, you can't see the other, there's actually two oxen that are yoked together. And then there is a, there's a plow behind it. Jesus said, anybody who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Now the truth is, what you saw there may have been shaped a little different, but that plow was not a lot different than what my grandfather and maybe my great-grandfather or maybe some of your parents used and years go by. We didn't use oxen. We used mules and horses and, and cows and children. <laughs> Whatever we could use to pull, pull that thing so we could lay out our rows to plant our garden. Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back. Jesus is not talking about glancing. He's not talking about remembering talking about having a love and affinity for the past that so consumed you that you, you, you pay more attention back there than you do what's ahead of you. Do you understand that what Jesus is saying? If you, you have to understand about the person who walks behind the plow. He's got several jobs. Number one, his job is to put weight on the handle. Because the rows of the furrows need to be deep enough because the only way you're going to have the best harvest or to keep the birds from eating the seed is to make sure the seed is deep enough in the ground. So he has to put weight down on the handles. But he has another problem. He carries in one hand an ox goat. It's a long stick with a pointed end. And the purpose of the ox goat is sometimes he would have to poke the ox in the rear to get the ox to move or he'd have to poke the one on the left to get that one to move or the one on the right to get that one to move so he's got to push down on the plow and he's got to 
goat, uh, he's got to, you know, take the ox goat and, and make the ox do what he wants it to do. Now imagine trying to push down, goad the ox, look back. Jesus said, now, take what you know about plowing and think about what I just said. If you were to push down on the plow and to go the ox, but you're looking backward, the first thing that's going to happen is your roads are going to be crooked. Here's the mercy and the grace of God. If you get the first one crooked, you've got time to fix it and make it right. But if you get the first one crooked and you're still turning around backwards, the next one's going to be more crooked. And the next one's going to be more crooked. And before you know it, you've got a whole field plowed full of crooked roads. Can I tell you that if you're trying to march forward for Jesus, but you're looking back, you don't have the ability to walk in a straight line when you are not fixed on the Lord Jesus. The way we're going to stay straight is to keep our eyes fixed on the one who is in front of us not what we've left behind us. Jesus said, if you're going to be part of the kingdom, and you put your hand to the plow and say, you're going to work for me and labor for me, you're not fit for the kingdom if you can't keep your head turned around and make sure your rows are straight. It was the Lord that promised in Isaiah 45 and 2 that he would make the crooked places straight. Now, why are we going to try to crook up something that he came and died for to make straight? No amens there, but that's the truth. He didn't come to allow us to to make crooked places. He came to straighten out crooked places. If you look back, it makes your rows crooked. If you look back, it also makes your rows too shallow. Because see, in order to put your weight here, your maximum weight down, your, your weight is in front of you. But if you try to turn around, all of a sudden, now you have no weight like you need. And the rows or the furrows are too shallow. And the guy that's got the bean bag or the corn bag or the squash bag or whatever he's planting is dropping down in places that are too shallow. You see, the key to having a good harvest is making sure the seed is deep enough. Because if it's deep enough, it's going to have a deep root system so that it can stand. You remember Jesus talking about the sower? The parable of the sower? And he said that some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and snatched it up. Do you understand that if the rows are too shallow, not only do some seed fall by the wayside, and the birds love to get that, but but if you you make the row too shallow and you cover it up, it's easy for the birds to find the seed. See, if you look back, your rows are crooked. If you look back, you fail to make the rows and the furrows deep enough and, and the birds of the air can come and snatch it away. How many times have our Sunday school teachers given us the seed, given us the word? How many times have your pastors and evangelists and other people given you the word, but somehow, some way, you were not paying attention? Your head was turned around backwards, and the seed did not fall in deep places, not because they didn't give you a deep word, but because you did not plow a deep enough furrow. The seed was snatched away. Looking back, not only makes your rows crooked and keeps them from being too deep, I've already alluded to the third one. Looking back causes your harvest not to be plentiful. Crooked rows really don't hold as much as straight rows. You know, we think it does, but over a course of time, they become running together. And the effect of what we're out there doing does not have its greatest potential. 
or because we made them too shallow and too much was fallen by the wayside or too many were eaten by the birds. There is not a great yield to our harvest. Jesus said, when you said you wanted to be part of my kingdom, you said you wanted to follow me, what you agreed to do was to put your hands to the plow and work. Remember that old song we used to sing was a hymn or an old hymn of the church? Work for the night is coming. Work. Work for the night is coming. Work. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to sit around my table. No one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Jesus said, if we're his people, we have laid our hands to the plow. And what he's expecting us to do is understand that sometimes it's okay to glance backward. Because if you're in a big long field and you still see a bunch of field in front of you, sometimes you want to know how much more you got to go. And you judge it by looking back. You remember learning to ride a bicycle? Your dad... Your mom or somebody's running behind you and they're holding the seat. And every once in a while, you turn and look to make sure they're there. And we're doing good to the first time we turn and look and they're gone. And then we're like, where are they? And we end up in the thorn bushes. It's the same way believers. We keep looking back looking back and then when we realize that we've gone some distance away we get so crooked so off course we fall in ditches and we end in bushes it's hard to reap the harvest when you're not in the field it's hard to reap the harvest when you haven't planted correctly it's hard to reap the harvest when your rows are crooked so here we are the last Sunday of 2015 And what should we be doing? Should we be looking backward? Well, there's some important things we can learn from backward. But I don't want to live there. There's some wonderful things that happened in 2015. But I don't want to go back and relive it. There's some terrible things that happened in 2015. And I don't want to go back and relive that either. So what do we do? We, we glance back to remember the promises of God. I said we look back to remember the promises of God. Did God say something to you? Did God say something to this church? If he didn't look back and grab a hold of his promise, but don't let your head stay backward. Take what God said and bring it with you into the future. It's okay to look backward and to remember the plans of God. What did God lay out and say was His plan and purpose for us? Take what God said in the past, a plan and purpose, and bring it with you into the future. We're here at the end of 2015. And yes, we can look back and see things we did wrong. Things we should have done better. Things we could do better. We look back and think of ways I could, I could have loved my family differently. I could have, I could have been more help. I could, have, I could have done this. I could have done that. I can't go back and change it. So what I do is I take what I learned from my past, but I grab it and bring it with me in my future. See, Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and say I'm part of the kingdom, you may glance backward and learn from the past, but you're never going to keep straight rows and make them deep enough and get your greatest potential yield of your harvest. If your head is backward, you're not even fit for the kingdom, he said. But if you'll put your head straight, fix your eyes on the Lord, put your weight down on the plow, go the ox, keep your eyes focused in Jesus, lay out the rows, you and I will yield a great harvest if we do it God's way. If you're going to plan on looking back and keep on looking back, if your plan is to dwell there, if your plan is wish that you are still there, you're going to have problems. 
It's going to end up in crookedness. You're going to end up shallow. Listen, you will find that people that tend to have issues spiritually in your life are people who have distanced themselves in relationship with God. I watched a little video, two, two minutes long, by Piper. can't remember his first name. But his thing was how, how, how people with PhDs in theology commit adultery. And this is what he said. There are people who can talk to you about theology all day, but they don't know God. They know about God. They can do an exegesis from the Word. They can tell you the Greek and the Hebrew. They can tell you all about the Word, but they don't know God. How many people that sit on our church pews all over America can tell you all about God, but they don't have a relationship with God? Why? Because we're still living in the past. Our name is written on some church roll. We went with our friends in the baptistry pool and got baptized. But the truth is, we don't know God. I'm ready for people who know God, who want God, who desire God, who are hungry for God more than anything in their past. They want God in their present and their future. We'll never have revival as long as we're thinking about the past. Love to read about revivals of the past. But what we need is something God's going to do with it today. What we need today may be different than what we had in 90. It may be different than what they had in the time of the Wells and the Welch and all of those revivals. What we need is something that will transcend our culture and what's going on now. We need something that will help us fight the Islam that is the fastest growing religion in the world. I tell you what we need. We need the power of God, the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost. And you'll never have it. You'll never see it. As long as you're looking backward. Glance, yes. Remember, yes. Measure distance, yes. Thank God you've departed, absolutely. See the weight or value of what you are in Christ versus what you were, absolutely. But no affection, no love, no, no connectivity to my past. I'm holding to the plow now. I've got a task. That's to lay out a straight row. You know what my dad and I used to do when I was growing up? He didn't let me do it often. But after I begged him, got on his nerves. My daddy would lay off a roll. He had an old snapper tiller. He'd lay off a roll. And he'd turn it around. And he'd give it to me. My objective was to make my row as straight as my dad's row. The problem was, at times, there were rocks and other things in the dirt you could not see. And when the tine would hit it, it would bounce. It would make the front end of that tiller jump up. And when it came down, it didn't come down back where I was at. It would come down over here. And I'd get it back. And when I'd get to the end and look, my row was like this. My problem wasn't that I was turning around backwards and looking. My problem was there was obstacles in my way. But see, rather than quitting where I was, I finished my row. Because I tried to look far enough out to keep the snapper tiller in line with a straight line my dad did. You see, if you turn around, you'll never see what the Lord has laid out. The steps of a good man, good woman, are ordered by the Lord. You will never follow those steps if you're looking backwards. Do I like everything that happened in 2015? No, I do not. I'm not happy about any of it. But I want to tell you what I am. I am confident that my God is able to do awesome things in 2016. I, I'm confident that when those of us that are in this room and others who were not here today, they're, they're still out on, on vacation and, and there are other places and they'll be here. But right now it's just me and you. 
I am confident that when we get it and our mind fixed, that our past is just a measurement. It is not where we long to be, but that God has something greater for us. We look back and grab every promise, every plan, every purpose, but we bring it with us into our future. And God is going to do great things. Oh, that was weak. God is going to do great things. No crooked roads. No shallow relationships. Understanding the value of Christ in me is worth far more than anything. My past life had. Today it's possible that there are people in the room who don't even know Jesus. You know, really don't even appreciate what we're talking about about looking back and all that because the truth is you're so bound where you are you've wanted to be free you've wanted to be out of that you've understood it's brought nothing but destruction to your life but you didn't know how to get out I'll tell you how you get out fix your eyes on Jesus right now His Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart's door that heart beating fast that cool feeling or that warm feeling you feel inside of you that's not, you know, you're hungry and ready for lunch. That's the Holy Spirit saying to you, i got a work I want to do in you today. If you'll confess that you're a sinner and ask Christ Jesus to remove your sin, invite Jesus to come live in your heart and your life and be the Lord of your life, guess what? That'll be, this will be the day Christ found you. And tomorrow when you glance, not, not look back with infinity, not, not look back with love and connection, when you look back to see where you were, you'll notice that you've moved some distance away. That's a good thing. It means what you used to be and what you used to do are now in your path. You're walking a new way. You put your hand to the plow. And you're learning. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you know the Lord, but you've had difficulty with looking just a little too long behind you. You would glance to see how far you come, but, but your eye would catch something that you used to be or used to do. Some place you used to go. Some friends you used to hang around with. And, and, and you, instead of moving your head back, you kept your head backward. Your road started getting crooked. You didn't know how to fix it. Because you didn't have the same relationship with the Lord, your roads are now shallow seed that is given to you falls by the wayside or, or is so shallow the birds of the air snatch it away. Today the Lord is saying, I didn't save you for you to look backward. I saved you to glance, but I saved you to keep your eyes fixed on me. And today if you fix your eyes on me, turn your head around, cut loose the thing that tries to bind you to your past. Take the promises I've given you from there and bring them with you into your future. See what I will do. Maybe we're in the room today and we don't look backward. We're not guilty of having an affinity for the past, having a connection to the past. Our problem is we really have trouble believing for the future. We're so stuck in the now. Huh? None of us, we don't want to go back and live there. But we really can't focus on the future. Because we're stuck right here. I want to enjoy my present. And what I do in my present prepares me for my future. But I don't want to get stuck in my present either. I want to understand this is the day the Lord has given me, but He's given me for something that's going to happen out there somewhere. Maybe you fall in one of those three categories. You don't know Jesus. You know Jesus, but you've got your head turned backward. And it's caused your life to become crooked and shallow maybe you're here today and you don't look backwards but you're stuck in your present and you don't even see your future you've heard me say it before but I think part of our problem is we, know, we just don't dream big enough we dream but we don't dream big enough see these big dreams take some time and time runs out into the future The reason why all this is important to all of us 
It's because until we bring the promises and plans into our present and into our future, we'll never see God do what He wants to do. And part of what God wants to do is He wants us to reap the harvest. Well, that's what we pay you for, preacher. No, you pay me to equip the saints. You pay me to do my part. But all of us are called to get in the harvest. All of us are called to be witnesses. All of us are called. Every one of us are called. Every one of us. A song came to me yesterday. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work? For me today, it seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. wants to work in my field. I'm asking everybody to stand. Kim is going to play this a little bit. And I'm going to invite you today. If you don't know Jesus, I'm asking you to come. Let us introduce you to Jesus. Let us show you. He's the best thing that will ever happen to you in your life. If you know Jesus, but you've allowed your head to turn around and become fixed with what's behind you. Now your life is crooked and your rows are too shallow and there's no yield in your harvest. I want you to come and talk to the Lord about it. Maybe you're here today, no problem looking at the past. But you really don't think too much in terms of the future. You're stuck in the present. If you're any one of those, I wish you'd come and let us pray with you today. As we sing it again, the invitation... It's for you. The altars are open. And we invite you to come. Come on, in the name of Jesus. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? Every head bowed, every eye closed just for one moment. If you're in the room today and you'll be honest and say, Pastor Terry, I really do seem to have this connection to my past. I want to be free. I am some distance away, but for some reason it's like my past just has a hold. And I've not been able to break loose completely. What I want to do today is I want to be able to cut loose totally once and for all to break free from that past if that's you would you mind slipping your hand up right back down I want to be free from my past is there anybody in the room today who say you know what pastor I I know I'm saved but but I've allowed myself to look back too much and I realize that it's hindered my relationship with Jesus and I'm a little shallow now compared to where I was. And, and I don't yield the kind of fruit that I should be yielding in my life at this point in my life. And I want to say to the Lord, I, I, I'm ready to get that fixed so I can have that relationship with Him I know that I've had before and that He wants me to have again. Would you just slip your hand up? Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here today. Say, so Pastor Terry, you know what? I have no trouble with looking backward. My problem is I don't look far enough into the future. I'm stuck in my present. I'm fixated on my present. 
And what I want God to help me to do is to understand that He's using my present to prepare me for my future. Help me to dream. Help me to believe. Help me to look forward in the name of Jesus. If that's you, I want to see your hand. I'm too fixated on the present and not looking far enough into the future. Father God, in the name of Jesus, it seems we have more people who, who know you, but they feel like they look too many times too long backward. And it's created a shallowness in their life and their relationship with you. God, they're longing to get back to that place where they have that deep relationship with you. I pray today, Lord, that your spirit would be real to them right now. And as they talk to you and as they give it to you, that, Lord, their head will turn back and their eyes will become fixed on Jesus. And the things that whatever caught their attention from the past will be severed and cut loose. And that, Lord, they'll build that relationship with you again that they've had before and that they know they desire and you desire to have with them. And for the others that raise their hand as well and the other places, speak to them, O oh Lord. Speak to them, Spirit of God. Have your way in their life today. And Father God, we'll be careful to honor, praise, and glorify your name. For you are greatly to be praised. You are to be exalted and lifted up. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes fixed on you because you'll never lead us astray and you'll keep us on the straight and narrow. We thank you for it and give you praise for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Make sure you're with us tonight. Brother Seth Brown is going to be bringing the word to us tonight. I know that you want to support him and hear the word the Lord's laid on his heart.